Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this fifth episode in my series on the murder of Inga Lodge. In today's episode, we will look at the events leading up to the arrest of Fred van der Pfeiffer for Inga's murder. But before we proceed, please subscribe to my channel. Your support will be appreciated. Thank you. Now, in the previous episode, we saw that how on April the 12th, Fred's fingerprint was matched to the print on the DVD holder that Inga rented just a few hours before her death. Logically, therefore, that Fred's fingerprint was found on this DVD holder means that Fred wasn't at work all day as he claimed, and that he must have been with Inga that afternoon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please do not underestimate how incriminating this evidence is. It's akin to a smoking gun. And even a judge acknowledged it as such when he said the following in his judgment. If it was indeed the accused fingerprint on it, it would mean that he was at her apartment after 1507 and not at work. This, of course, would have destroyed his alibi. So when we look and evaluate the police's investigation, we must consider what was in their minds. What were they thinking? They knew that Pauline one was legitimate, that it was from a DVD holder. That was their sincere belief. And that is what guided them in the further investigation. So what would you expect of the police to do after finding such incriminating evidence? Should you go easy on a suspect and keep looking at other suspects because you don't want to appear to be developing tunnel vision on one particular person? Or do you shift your focus of your investigation to that person who you know left behind very incriminating fingerprint evidence? Especially considering that up to that point, there were no forensic evidence that pointed to another suspect. We expect a lot of our police and we want them to be efficient and effective to put our tax money to good use, to make the best of the time and resources. We certainly do not want the police to be chasing ghosts when there was already a suspect in the flesh against which had very strong evidence. Now, the police did not immediately act on this information and did not apply for an arrest warrant immediately. Instead, they decided to further the investigation and to look for more evidence. And to that end, they applied for search warrants to search through Fred's office, his flat, and his vehicle. Now, Anthony Altbaker would like you to believe that because the police continued their investigation into Fred to look for further evidence, that that somehow means that the police weren't certain and had doubts about the fingerprint, that they weren't really sure that the print came from a DVD cover. That's absolute nonsense. In any investigation, your goal is to collect as much evidence you can to put forth your strongest case, even if all this evidence results in a lot of redundancy. So while the police were getting their search warrants in order, on the 14th, Fred and his father negotiated with Old Mitchell to grant Fred unpaid leave. Old Mitchell agreed and even offered to pay for a flight ticket to East London. Fred declined the offer because he wants to stay in Pinelands to assist the private investigators. To this end, on the same day, Fred went with a private investigator to Inga's flat to see if he could see anything suspicious. Fred did not see anything out of the ordinary. Now, the police executed the search warrants on Friday, the 16th of April. At about 1 p.m., Fred's colleagues were requested by a supervisor, Mrs. Nikki Holzhausen, to leave the work areas as the police wanted to search Fred's work area. About 10 officers arrived. Fred's cell phone was immediately confiscated and a Captain Talmakis told him that he was a suspect in the murder of Inga Lodge. The best of my knowledge, this was the first time that Fred learned that he was a suspect. Fred asked if he could call his father, but his request was denied. But Marcus told him that he could call his father later. The police then looked through his desk in his briefcase and his work area and found and collected several notes and letters that Inga wrote, including the long letter. 
You can see um, this video showing Fred's work area. So after the search at Old Mutual, they drove Fred to his flat in Antwerp Village. And here are some photos that the police took of the flat. Now the police searched through the flat and collected the following items from Fred's bedroom. A long grey coloured pants, a blue shirt, a black polo fleece jacket, and a striped shirt. These were all backed by Inspector Cock, and per normal process Fred was asked to sign each evidence bag, which he did. A variety of shoes were found in the wardrobe, and these were handed to Superintendent Bartholomew, who wanted to see if any of the shoes was a match to the identified unidentified shoe print he found at the crime scene. So one of the shoes that was found was this high-tech squash shoe. It seemed as if the shoe has been recently washed and that the shoelaces have been taken out and tucked into the toe area of the shoe. This after Fred initially said that the shoelaces were at uh, his parents' home in the Eastern Cape. So while Fred was with the police in the bedroom, he heard the voice of uh, Mrs. Nikki Holzhausen in the living room. So she came into the middle of an active investigation to supposedly check how Fred was doing. Fred wanted to go out to go speak with her, but the police refused and told him to stay in the bedroom. I'm not sure if they had a warrant for this, but the police also conducted the search of Marius Butcher's room with Fred being present. So after the search, through the flat, the police took uh, Fred back to his vehicle that was parked uh, in the old mutual parking lot. And then accompanied by Tom Marquis, Fred was asked to drive to the Bishop Labour's police station. And there was a discussion during the drive, a conversation between Tom Marquis and Fred. Tom Marquis told Fred that they had evidence that places him at the crime scene the afternoon of Inga's death and that he murdered her. Fred replied that, that it's simply not possible. Marquis said that he could see that they were very much in love, but that something went very wrong that afternoon. He also threatened, he also threatened Fred that he would send him to prison for life. Uh, Fred supposedly started fearing for his life because he thought at that time nobody knew where he was. But can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the cold horror that must have ripped through Fred when he found out that his fingerprint was found on that DVD holder? He must have known how incriminating it is. So after Fred parked his vehicle at the Bishop Labour's police station, the police asked him if he had any valuables in his vehicle. And Fred told him that he had a hammer under the seat, which was a gift that he received from Inga's mother. He then took it out and showed it to the police. And the police told him to put it back where he found it. So Fred was then taken inside the police station building for further questioning and the police continued to photograph his vehicle and to conduct a search through it. The following items were collected and placed in evidence bags. One hammer, an ornamental hammer, with a bottle opener on the one side, a pair of scissors with orange handles, a hair from the blade of the scissors, as you can see in this photo, a wheel spanner behind the seat, a black bag with a shirt and pants in the back of the vehicle, a seat cover underneath the driver's seat, and two seat covers under the passenger seat. So meanwhile, in the police station building, Fred was facing a very aggressive, sometimes good cop, sometimes bad cop interrogation by a variety of officers. Apparently the police used a lot of foul language they shouted and screamed at him, found him furniture, reenacted the murder, threatened to show him photos of Inga, threatened to put him in post postmore prison with some very bad people that might kill him, and they even accused him of having a homosexual relationship with Marius Butter. But Fred steadfastly maintained his innocence, and at some stage he refused to talk, uh, to exercise his right to remain silent. Repeated requests for him to call his father was, were denied. 
And after about four hours, the interrogation finally ended at about 7 p.m., at which time Fred was allowed to call his father, who at the time was in Frabeau, probably anxious to hear from Fred. So after having received a call from Mrs. Holzhausen earlier that day, uh, Louis van der Fleyford tried to call Fred's phone several times uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, Fred was very emotional and asked his father to come immediately. So according to Louis van der Fleyford, he drove from Rabot to Pinelands in about half an hour, and sometimes driving as fast as 210 kilometers per hour. He said that when he arrived at the flat, Fred stormed at him and just collapsed in his arms, a completely broken man. Fred was in such a state that Mrs. Nicky Holthausen had to take him to the hospital where he was administered as a sedative. Uh, Fred's father then decided to stay behind and not to leave Fred alone in case the police wanted to arrest Fred. On April the 22nd, Fred, accompanied by his father, went to a doctor in Stellenbosch where in the presence of Inspector de Villiers, blood and hair samples were obtained from Fred. These samples were then delivered to the forensic laboratory four days later on April the 26th. Now, on 25th of April, Fred had an interview with the private investigators, where he was supposedly asked some hard questions. And all the questions and his answers were recorded and written down. Afterwards, they advised Fred to volunteer for a polygraph test. And Fred agreed, and the investigators proceeded to arrange one, which Fred undertook on April the 29th. And apparently, he passed the test. A couple of remarks regarding this. I want to know when Fred was asked, was Fred asked the same questions that he was asked four days before by the private investigators? And did this help him to get through the lie detector test? Secondly, the test was conducted by a private firm, likely paid by Louis van der Feyfer, and it was not done by the police. And then I would like to know, was this the first and only test that he did? Or were there perhaps tests before this one, which he did not pass? Because if he failed the test, we certainly would not know about it. Now, there are several well-known countermeasures that the person can use to read the polygraph test. And this is well documented in the research. The one way is to inflict pain and discomfort on yourself during the interview by, for example, pricking yourself with a sharp object. The body's response to this would lead to an elevated baseline readings that would mask deception. Another way is to suppress the body's reaction to deception by using drugs such as sedatives and tranquilizers. Now on April 26, the items collected in Fred's vehicle and flat were delivered to the forensic laboratory where they were tested for blood and hair. Now to test for blood, the items were treated with luminol. Now, luminol is a chemical that reacts with the homoglobin in, that's found in red blood cells. And this reaction causes the red blood cells to glow, and therefore it's a test that needs to be done in the dark. And in this photo, you can see on the left-hand side what it would look like normally, and what on the right-hand side, you see what it looked like after the application of luminol. There are hundreds and thousands of homoglobin molecules in blood, and so it's a very sensitive method. And it has been published that luminol is able to detect a 1 to 5 million dilution of blood. It's extremely sensitive. Now, luminol can react with other substances, such as, for example, copper and bleach, and is therefore only a presumptive test. However, luminol reacts differently with different substances in terms of the color, the intensity, and the durations of the fluorescence. And forensic scientists are trained to identify with a high degree of accuracy when luminol actually reacts with blood. Furthermore, Blood is the only substance that will react with luminol twice. In other words, after a reapplication of luminol. So it is, so they can say with a high degree of accuracy when the luminol reacts with blood and not with another substance. So only two items reacted with the application of luminol. And according to the 
to the laboratory staff, both reactions were consistent with the presence of blood in terms of its color, intensity, duration, and very importantly, repeatability. Now, the first item was the orange handled scissors found in Fred's vehicle. According to the laboratory staff, the reaction was observed on the blades close to the handle, but not on the tips. So it seems unlikely that the scissors were used to stab someone. A sample was collected for DNA analysis, but unfortunately, there wasn't enough DNA to develop a profile. The second item was the ornamental hammer that was found under the seat of Fred's vehicle. Now, the reaction was observed on a rubber handle. There were a long over and shorter mark on opposing sides of the handle that in the opinion of the analyst corresponds comfortably to the thumb base and finger base areas of the hand. It looked like somebody gripped the handle. There was no reaction on the metal shaft or the hammer head. And it seemed to indicate the possibility that the hammer was cleaned very well. So every little bit of the luminal liquid mix was collected for DNA extraction. Now a DNA analysis was performed and the best that could be determined was that the DNA material found belonged to a male person. They, they couldn't even determine for sure that it belonged to Fred van der Paper. Now considering that Fred handled the hammer shortly before the police took it into possession when he took it out from behind the seat, one would expect his DNA to be found on the hammer. It should be noted that Fred never claimed nor admitted that he has ever bled in a hammer. Now, the fact that female DNA wasn't found on a hammer is that 100% conclusive proof that the blood that was observed on a hammer could not be from a woman. Absolutely not. And let me explain you why. So let's start with biology. In blood, you have two types of cells, red blood cells and white blood cells. Now, red blood cells have iron-rich homoglobin, and that is what react with luminol. But red blood cells do not have DNA. White blood cells do. But in blood, there are many more red blood cells than white blood cells. In fact, only 0.2% of all cells are white blood cells. In other words, for every white blood cell, there are about 500 to 600 red blood cells. And considering also how sensitive this test is, you don't need a lot of red blood cells to show a reaction. So in practice, it can be extremely difficult to find a sufficient number of white blood cells to develop a DNA profile. It is said that you need about 40 white blood cells to develop a profile. And that could be very difficult, especially on a weapon that has been cleaned. Now, the forensic analyst prepared a Section 212 affidavit and signed it on June the 9th, 2005. And all that it said is that possible blood could be detected on the hammer and the scissors. Now, a Section 212 affidavit are sworn statements that must comply with the very strict requirements of Section 212 of the Criminal Act. And they are used by forensic investigators to enter the result of scientific tests as evidence without them actually having to testify in court themselves. But one of the requirements of the Act is that it is not permissible to express an opinion or an interpretation in an affidavit like this. It doesn't matter how solid the basis for your opinion is. So in this case, the forensic analyst could not say what she really thought. She could not say that the nature of the luminal reaction was very highly consistent with blood. And to move away from possible blood to certain blood, a, defini a definitive test for blood was required, but such a definitive test was never conducted because they decided to skip directly to DNA testing. And DNA testing is not a test for blood. But sometime after the hammer was tested for blood, on May the 17th, the hammer was given to Captain Barrett's ballistics expert. And his task was to determine if the hammer could have been used to inflict the wounds on in Inga's head. Now we know there were two types of wounds found on in Inga's head, round circular wounds and linear wounds. And here the police found a hammer 
in freight vehicle where the round striking surface could have made the round wounds and the bottle opening part could have made the linear wounds. So Moretz took the hammer and did a one-to-one -one transparency overlays over the wounds on Inga's head and he determined that the circular wounds had the same diameter as the striking surface of the hammer and that the width of the bottle opener part was consistent with the width of the linear wounds. So here we see some overlays that my brother Thomas did to show how well the hammer fits the wounds. Unfortunately, I don't have access to Maritza's overlays. So using the hammer and another similar hammer, Maritza did experiments on pig's heads, sheep heads, clay and lead in order to determine and to study the shape of the wounds that would have resulted from being struck by both parts of the hammer's head. And here we have a video of them hitting the pig's head with the hammer. And here we have the result of using the opening side, the bottle opener part of the hammer on clay, and also the striking surface on a lead plate. Now it is true that during the exercise of hitting the pig's head, the bottle opener side of the hammer bent slightly, which wouldn't come as a surprise, and I will explain that later in another episode. And I will also explain in that episode that the fact that the hammer bent has absolutely nothing to do with whether the hammer could have been used to murder Inga or not. So as there were no micro characteristics in the wounds that could definitively link it to the hammer, all that Maritz could do is to show that an ornamental hammer like that, like the one that was found in Fred's vehicle, could have made the wounds on Inga's head. And that is what he found, and that's also what he put in his affidavit, which he signed on June the 7th, that an ornamental hammer like the one that Fred owned could have made the wounds on Inga's head. And not just any hammer, not a claw hammer, but an ornamental hammer like that. The shoes that uh, were collected from Fred were given to Sup Superintendent Bartholomew. Now, if you remember, Bartholomew took a number of uh, shoe prints in Inga's flat using the electrostatic death lifter. And we know that all the prints except for one was matched to police officers that were at the crime scene. Now, the unidentified shoe print was found in the bathroom and appeared to be from a sports shoe. And Bartholomew wanted to see if red shoes would match the unidentified shoe print. So he did the comparisons, he did the matching, and found that none of shoes prints, none of red shoes were a match to this print. So at this point, you may wonder. If it wasn't Fred's shoe or the a police shoe, then who could have left the shoe print? Well, let's look at who all were in the flat and the 24 hours preceding the murder. Obviously, there was Inga herself. The previous day, we had Sylvia Strauss, who came for a Bible study session. On the morning of her death, we had the three Tylers, Rodney, Arthur, and Adam. And also the day before, the person that changed the locks could potentially be in the flat as well. So there are people that could have left this unidentified shoe print. Now to further investigate the blood mark on the bathroom floor, Bartholomew contacted a, su a superintendent, Kukumur, from the national processing team in Pretoria to assist in the investigation. So on April the 28th, Kukumur and his team flew in went to Inga's flat and applied a meter black to the blood mark and the surrounding areas. Now, a meter black is a chemical that is used to enhance existing marks and to make invisible marks visible. So Kukumur also tested the blood mark first to see, to confirm that it was blood. Now, the meter black greatly enhanced the blood mark and brought forward a lot of detail in it and other marks on the floor that weren't visible before now became visible and in the area that was previously covered with a towel. Here you can see on the left hand side what it looked like before the application of the middle black. This photo was taken at about 12 p.m. And then on the right hand side as a photo that was taken two hours later after the application of a middle black. And you can see how much more clear 
the blood marks are. So on May the 5th, a French attorney, William Booth, wrote a letter to Director Atti Trollope outlining Fred's alibi. It doesn't seem like the police were particularly interested in following up an alibi, because they, in their mind, had very solid forensic evidence against Fred. In my opinion, it was a mistake for them not to do this, and in my opinion, they should have looked at Fred's alibi immediately after his interview the morning of the 17th. About two weeks later, on May the 28th, the police, after the police still had not taken any witness statements, the, on the papers uh, retained a, a private security firm called Cumex South to obtain sworn statements from a number of French colleagues. And during the first two weeks in June, about two and a half months after the murder, and quite some time after Fred became a suspect, Humic South obtained 14 witness statements altogether, of which nine were from Mr. Park staff, who were either in the gap session for Fred or supposedly saw Fred there in the meeting or in his office on the 16th of March. Now, in an episode uh, where I will deal exclusively with the alibi, I will show that these statements weren't, weren't with the paper they were written on, and it was just another deliberate attempt to shield Fred. So by June the 9th, the police had the following. A fingerprint found on a DVD holder that belonged to Fred van der Faber, placing him in the presence of Inga that afternoon. They had a report from a ballistic expert, Captain Moritz, that concluded that the hammer that belonged to Fred and it was found in his vehicle could have made the wounds on Inga's head. They had a report from the forensic laboratory that indicated the possible blood was detected on the hammer. They had a long letter which indicated that there was a serious argument or disagreement between Fred and Inga in the morning of the murder. And they also had no evidence, forensic or otherwise, that indicated the potential involvement of another person. So what about Werner Carolus, some of you may ask? Didn't he confess to the murders? A bit later in this episode, I will deal with him and I will quickly put your minds at ease that he had nothing to do with this murder. Now at this point, it's also important to note that by June the 9th, the shoes, red shoes, weren't suspicious at all. They only became objects of interest much later on July the 22nd, after Bartholomew and Cox started comparing the soles of the shoes for photos of the Amido black treated blood mark, which they photographed at the, in Inga's flat. It's only then that Bartholomew noticed a correlation between the shape of the blood mark and parts of the sole of Fred's high-tech squash shoes. But I will talk about the shoes and the blood mark in great amount of detail in another episode. So on June the 9th, probably shortly after receiving the Section 212 affidavit from the Forensic Laboratory about possible blood in the hammer, Director Ati Trollope applied for and was granted a warrant to arrest Fred for the murder of Inga Lodz. So five days later, uh, Cumex South prepared an alibi report, which was sent to the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, in which they said that Fred had an alibi for the 16th of March, that he was at work at Mr. Park between 11.08 and 18.06, and it could be confirmed by the following evidence. There was the turnstile security logs, security camera footage, at least seven witness statements by Mr. Park staff, as well as computer and cell phone records. I will look at these in more detail in the episode that deals with the alibi. So on June the 15th, knowing that there was an arrest warrant out for Fred, we found a favor, drove his son all the way from East London to Stellenbosch to hand him over to police at the Clutersville police station. It was like Abram who had to offer his son, he said. In the same day, Fred also appeared in front of the Stellenbosch Magistrate's Court and he was released on 10,000 rand bail. Now about Werner Carolus. I will cover Werner Carolus in great detail in another episode and I can guarantee you that Anthony Altbeker and his compadre, 
Matthew Brown, the producer of the News 24 podcast, is not going to like what I have to say at all. So who was Werner Carolis? He was a gang member, a drug addict, and a criminal with a long history of car theft and burglary. So 12 days after the murder, on March 28th, the police learned of a certain Werner Carolis, who on the 24th showed his friends a bunch of keys and apparently confessed to them that he had murdered the student. He told his friends that during the murder he wore women's clothing and a wig, and he also showed them the marks where the student bit and scratched him. Carolis told his friend Jakub Swanepoel that he burned the dress and a wig afterwards and that he didn't steal anything from the flat because he was scared the police may catch him or something. This story, however implausible, probably spread quickly in police circles and beyond and eventually must have reached the ears of those willing to move heaven and earth to protect Fred. It then so happens that nine days after Fred's fingerprints were matched at Princeton, the DVD holder, the rollers, after he was arrested for cell phone theft in Springbok in the Northern Cape, made a formal confession that while breaking into Inga's flat, he witnessed his friends killing her. So first he said that he killed her, and now he's saying that his friends killed him. Carolas went on to confess that on a Saturday night at about 10 o'clock, he and four others, including his friend Jakub Swanepo, went to the student center at the university campus where they observed a young woman. Swanepo pointed to a blonde woman and told him that in the flat, she had a laptop, a cell phone, and money, and that she lived alone. Rollers claimed that the woman regularly brought bought drugs from them. They then followed her to a flat where they climbed over a spike fence into a yard, and here one of his friends looked through the window and saw Inga moving inside the flat and scratching around in her carry bag. He said the flat was open plan, like most flats these days, with a kitchen and lounge in one. He then went to press the others and three of them climbed through a window while he stood guard outside. I remember Inga's windows all had burglar bars. After a while he heard screams and as he approached in order to investigate, Swanapool climbed back out through the window and the other two ran out the door. When he asked what was going on, he was told that there was trouble and that they had to get away from there. So instead of running away, Carolas went to the window, lifted it up, poked his head through, and saw Inga lying with her head and body on the couch and her legs off the couch. Blood was running down her arm. In another version, Carolas said that they gained access to the flat because one of his friends was an acquaintance of Inga and she let them in. Now, Carolas was right about the open plan layout, which is not surprising. About the handbag, well, most people have handbags, especially women, and the body on the couch, even though you got a position of Inga's body all wrong. Inga's legs weren't off the couch, and her arm wasn't hanging off the couch for blood to drip from it. There are also other obvious mistakes. Inga was not murdered on a Saturday night, and all of Inga's windows had burglar bars, making it impossible for anyone to climb through. And also, Inga wasn't a drug user, and she didn't buy drugs, nor did she sell any drugs. There was just no, absence, no evidence whatsoever to support that in any possible way. So after the interview and confession on uh, 19th of April in Springbok, uh, they brought Carolus to Stellenbosch, where on the 21st he was asked to do a pointing out. So without any assistance, he had to point out where the crime scene was. He couldn't. He managed to take the police as far as the Shiraz complex, but he didn't know which flat belonged to India. Now, it shouldn't be surprising that he knew about the Shiraz complex. Uh, news of the murder spread through the community. It was in the news. Everybody knew about it. People knew there was a, a murder in the Shiraz complex. And obviously, that's how he found out. The fact that he knew it was a Saras complex is, is no corroboration for his story whatsoever. Carole, during his first pointing out, Carolus became so stressed that 
and I have to stop the pointing out. Now, it gets really interesting because the rulers requested a second pointing out the next day. At this time, he was successful in pointing to the correct flat. And he told the same story that three of his friends entered the apartment, while two of them stayed outside. He heard screams, his friends ran away. He went up to have a look and saw Inga's body. The same story. And then he was interviewed by the Villiers and Trollope on April the 25th. And after this interview, Carolus recanted his confession. And he apologized for the inconvenience that he caused and for, and for telling lies. Much later, uh, more than two years later, Carolus claimed that he was threatened by Trollope and the Villiers. Uh, and that they told him to recant his admission, otherwise they would make life very difficult for him. And they also said that if he cooperates, they would drop a charge of vehicle theft against him. And I will talk about that more in another episode. Well, Carol has explained uh, why he was successful at the second pointing out. Uh, apparently, he heard some police officers uh, talk and he also saw uh, a crime scene tape that indicated to him which flat it was. And he claimed he made all of this up to get back at the gang member after the drug deal had gone bad. Now, my unsubstantiated opinion, opinion is that someone had a word of Carolus after his first failed attempt and gave him some guidance on how to do better the next time. So during the criminal trial, the judge ordered that the police investigate Carolus for obstructing and defeating the ends of justice when he purposefully supplied the police with false information. And the police then opened the docket in order to pave, charge, pave the way for these charges. Now, the director Trollope rightfully and with good reason dismissed Carolus' version as gutter garbage. However, according to Anthony Altbecker, director Trollope approached Carolus' statement with a puritanical lack of imagination and curiosity. He said that Trollope rejected Carolus' admissions with such confidence, not because of their errors and inconsistencies, but because he was already convinced that he had his man. He says that Trollope, after having seen the nature of the crime, that it was done by somebody close to Inga, the letter and the hammer, that Trollope persuaded himself that Carolus must be lying. So let's look at it again. Carolus said that Inga bought drugs. That's a lie. He said that Inga was murdered on a Saturday. That's a lie. He said that people climbed through a window. That's a lie. He said that Inga was murdered in the evening. That's a lie. He said that blood dripped from her arm. That's a lie. He said that her legs were off the couch. That's a lie. He failed his first pointing out, and yet Trollope had to use a letter and a hammer to persuade himself that Carolus was a liar? It's absolutely absurd. It seems that Trollope was at least intelligent enough to see Carolus for who he really was, as evidenced by the fact that Carolus went on to change his version several times. He started off by saying that he killed Inga, and then he ended up by saying that he saw Inga being killed by her uncle, and then her uncle cannibalized her by eating her flesh. I promise you, I'm not making this up. And I will go into a lot more detail in another episode. Now, something I bet you didn't know about. On the same day as the pointing out, the police conducted a search of a house in Crutusville, associated with Werner Carolus. From the house, they collected a butcher knife, a shirt, and a pair of shoes. And from a vehicle, they could collect a Wilkinson sword carving knife. And these items were delivered to the for forensic laboratory on April 26 to be tested for hair and blood. So this is after they already identified Fred's fingerprint on the DVD holder. They were doing forensic investigations into objects that were belonging to Werner Carulis. After an application of luminol, 
possible blood was, de was detected on the carving knife, which was found in the car. Unfortunately, sufficient DNA could not be retrieved to develop a DNA profile. Um, it should be at no surprise to find a blood on a knife belonging to a gangster. Also, after his initial statement on April the 12th, Marius was again questioned by Director Ati Trollop on the 27th of April, and he signed another sworn statement on the 29th of April. Amongst others, Marius was questioned about a curse that he spoken over Inga and Fred. So even after Fred's prints were identified, the police were still questioning Marius about the curse. Also, between April the 14th and 18th, the police received old, old missile security logs, work phone records, computer access records, and internet activity records of Fred van der Pfeiffer, Marius Porter, and Bram Creer. These records clearly confirm Bram's, Bram Creer's alibi. He was pretty active on the internet all afternoon. Now, based on the information provided in the previous episode, the police did not consider Fred a suspect right until they found his fingerprint on a DVD holder. And then they continued their investigation. They looked into Werner Carolus, they questioned him, they investigated him, they eliminated him. They looked into Marius Wurta, they questioned him, they eliminated him. They looked into Bram Creer, they could find no evidence against him or Marius Wurta. But they found a hammer belonging to Fred van der Paper which their trusted experts told them had possible blood on and they could have made a wound on Inga's head. And then they also had the letter that showed that there was an argument or a disagreement between Inga and Fred in the morning of the day that she was killed. So why did the judge say this? Uh, I think that they too much concentrated on op, op Fred and, 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 and not on the case as so I think that they must be a way to go as not Fred. I think that in the früher stadium they think, but it must be Fred. Wees. So maybe this team judge can tell us, based on the police, the evidence that the police had, who else should they have investigated? What should they have done? And why should the police have disregarded the fingerprint and the hammer evidence? And the letter. Why? To what end should the police have ignored this and not focused their investigation on Fred van der Vaper? So let's talk about the private investigators. So on April the 27th, the private investigators got an email from Mrs. Lotz that the services are no longer required. Now it seems that the investigators did not get along with the police, in particular with uh, Director Ati Trollop, and they weren't very cooperative with the police. And that is one of the reasons they were hired to assist the police. In addition, one of the investigators was very close to Louis van der Vaper. And therefore, he lacked the objectivity what one would expect from an investigator. On April the 13th, one of the investigators got a call from Trollope asking the investigator to make a sworn statement. So this is the day after Fred's fingerprints were matched to the DVD cover. The investigator said that he was not going to make a sworn statement and that he had nothing more to say than what was in his report of 11th of April. Remember, this is now the same report that did not identify Fred in the favor as a suspect. Now it looked like Trollope may have smelled a rat. In my opinion, he probably wanted to know what was going on, why the investigators didn't identify Fred as a suspect. And when asked about the 11th of April report, Trollope said, yes, he, he saw it, he read it, but it was meaningless. And at some point, the investigator also told Trollope that he should get his own witness statements and not just rely on theirs. Now, in June 2005, uh, I'm not sure whether it was before or after uh, the arrest of Fred, uh, Louis van der Feyfer retained Christian Boerta and there are else private investigators from the East London area to assist in the investigation into Inga's murder. Now, according to an affidavit by Daryl Els dated uh, May the 27th, 2009, 
They conducted a preliminary investigation that identified Inga's uncle, Ian Mayberg, as someone who could be involved in her murder. The reason for the, for the suspicion was the fact that Mayberg apparently immediately created an alibi for himself, that he aligned himself with the Trollope and the Valiers, and that when a newspaper article appeared in the Cape Times requesting uh, information from the public, Mayberg supplied his own cell phone number and else believe that Mayberg did this in order to screen all information that came in before sharing it with the police. So the request for information that appeared in the newspaper reads as follows. Anyone with information on the murder can contact Ian Mayberg at this number or the Serious and Violent Crimes Unit at this number. So it wasn't just Ian Maybach's number, there was a police number as well. So we are not sure what happened to Els and what after their preliminary investigation. Uh, I think because there was a tight budget, they, they stopped their investigation, at least until December 2007, uh, shortly after the conclusion of the criminal case. But we will look at that in another episode. So that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your time and for your attention. In the next episode, I will look at how the defense dealt with this very incriminating fingerprint evidence. And there's a lot of interesting information to reveal. Until then, stay tuned. And thank you very much.